So yeah, welcome. Um, so this is our almost final with one bonus coming December 13th, but our uh, almost final webinar of our fall learning series. We're so glad that you're here. Um, and this is going to be the third of the fall um, case study and dialogue of land return. Um, so this is one of several things we've offered this fall, and we're thrilled to have you as part of our learning community. And we'll be talking with Callie Walker and Duran Chavis about the Central Virginia Land, or sorry, Central Virginia Agrarian Commons and um, the the anchor, one of the anchor um, land donations that took part to make that possible. So um, as always, this is, um, yeah, we're we're here to really be in learning together about what land justice can really look like. Um, and we're so grateful for Callie and Duran to help us color in an amazing story about what is possible. Um, before we do that, I'll just give a little bit of a, a recap and an introduction um, to this story. Then we'll hear from both Duran and Callie, and then from them together, there'll be a lot of time for Q&A, so keep your questions handy. Um, but first, uh, so just a reminder, we are the Nuns and Nuns Land Justice Project. We work with religious communities and movement partners to create land transitions that are rooted in ecological and racial healing. And as part of that work, we offer these educational opportunities so that we can be more informed about what's possible when it comes to land justice. When we talk about land justice, um, we think about it with uh, as having three really important and interlocking components. Um, protecting land from extraction, regenerating the health of land, and expanding land equity to Black and Indigenous communities and other dispossessed communities, and in general, decommodifying um, land. The practice of land justice then involves centering ecological, social, and racial justice in decisions about how land is used, how land is loved, and how land is governed by people. So all fall and all year, really, we've been looking at different ways that this can look. And um, yeah, today we're gonna get into one great story about that. Um, before I give a little bit more of an introduction, just a couple of technical reminders, please stay muted um, through the interview so that we can hear Callie and Duran well. If you have any technical, um, difficulties or you need assistance, go ahead and chat Brenna, um, who is here. Brenna and Eric are here as part of the land justice team and will be here to support. Um, and at the end, when we have our Q&A, if you have a question that you'd like to share for that, please chat it to Brenna as well. So maybe Brenna, if, oh, there, there, Brenna's the last one there in the chat, Brenna Anglada, so you can click on her name and um, chat her directly. Okay, ready to roll? Um, so, okay, so let's jump in here. Um, so today we're going to hear from Callie Walker and Duran Chavis about the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons. Um, this is a project in and around Richmond, Virginia, that supports BIPOC, that's Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, control of land for the purpose of building resilient regional food systems. And um, the commons is a very unique model of land ownership that was really designed to support regenerative farming and regional food systems for the next generation of farmers. This is a really important innovation on traditional models of land trust. And I want to just give a little bit more context for what this means when we talk about um, the agrarian commons model and what it's a part of. So I'm going to start by just going back to what a traditional conservation trust does. A traditional land trust's goal is to protect land and habitats 
from bad things like development or extraction. They do a very good job of making sure that bad things don't happen to land. But within that, they a lot of times they'll use things like easements to do that. Um, so they protect land, but the land is still privately owned. It can change hands. The easement stays, so bad things don't happen, but that land can still be sold for top dollar to who it doesn't, the land trust doesn't really concern itself with who the land goes to or what's happening other than making sure bad things don't happen. And this is reductive and there are definitely collaborations with conservation trusts that happen with um, the agrarian commons. But the important part here is that the agrarian commons is an innovation on the land trust that protects natural ecosystems while also expanding affordable land tenure forever for regenerative farmers because Today, the biggest barrier to regenerative stewardship and farming is the high cost of land. And so the commons gets at that by giving affordable long-term leases um, and supporting collective governance of land across a whole region. So we're gonna hear about how Callie's family farm became a part of that. So here's Callie's farm, it's in Amelia, outside of Richmond, Virginia. Um, it's, it's not what you would typically consider a farm, right? It's a big piece of land that she'll tell you more about, but it can be used um, to regeneratively farm. And instead of just conserving that and make sure nothing bad happens, oops, excuse me, um, Callie's land in becoming part of the commons is going to become part of a regional patchwork of urban and rural land in and around Richmond that is all in service of a resilient regional food system. Oops, I keep going backwards here. So um, a board that collectively owns all of this patchwork of land that's made up of a majority of local people, and people of color, they work together um, to identify farmers and stewards that meet those high ecological standards and they give them affordable long-term leases, sometimes up to 99 years. So that's where this um, farm then becomes part of a, a huge kind of local ecosystem of properties um, you have affordable land across a whole ecosystem that is protected. It's regeneratively stewarded forever. And it's doing that all while healing a legacy of black land loss due to racist policies. So the agrarian commons is a whole ecosystem for land access, healthy soil, um, where decisions are me being made by people on the ground. There are 13 of these commons across the country that number is growing and um, we won't hear as much from them today, but Ian and Christina are both here from the national organization Agrarian Trust that supports all of these local commons in growing and flourishing. So the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons, which is the one that we'll hear from today, is um, centering this work of building BIPOC control of land and regional food systems they do this by having a majority black board of directors. They center the interdependence of rural and urban communities, and they model land justice through a gift of generationally white held land. And that we're talking about Callie's farm. Um, so that's, that's what we're talking about today. And um, I'll stop my slides here um, and just say that, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the context in which this um, project sits, which is part of a national movement to really marry the goals of conservation with a bigger goal of expanding equity and ensuring affordable regenerative farming um, forever. So today we have Duran Chavis and Callie Walker with us. They're gonna share more about the goals and vision of this particular work and the donation of Callie's farm to be an anchor property for the project. 
Um, so we'll start by hearing from Duran, if we want to bring him on screen while I read this amazing bio. Duran started his career in community advocacy at the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia, where he founded the highly acclaimed Happily Natural Day Festival, which was a supplement to the museum's summer jazz concert that focused on cultural awareness, health, wellness, and social change. Um, in 2009, he launched Richmond Noir Market, which is a Saturday farmer's market targeting low-income communities located in what the USDA has designated as food deserts. Three years later, he developed a community garden that led to urban farms, orchards, and vineyards, working on poverty mitigation, workforce development, health, and racial equity. Um, so Duran has been stewarding this movement for a long time in Richmond um, and is one of the founding board members of the CVAC. Um, so we're going to hear, uh, Duran, I'll just hand it over to you. Um, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, we just want to hear um, about your work and how it led to this larger vision of the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, I'd like to first say thank you for opportunity to share and uh, thank you for all the folks that have tapped in today to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about the C Central Virginia Agrarian Commons um, and the work that we're doing here in Virginia. Um, how did I get into this work? I started um, uh, really trying to advocate for holistic health and wellness um, in my community. And uh, the work that we uh, did uh, with the Black History Museum and, and the launch of the Happily Natural Day Festival really served as an incubator for us to iterate solutions in our community. Um, the festival is, is rooted in uh, the need for spaces for Black and Brown communities to address um, uh, uh, self-determination, and uh, uh, lift up uh, the, the work that needs to be done to heal intraracially, like within black and brown communities uh, from the impacts and external, externalities of white supremacy and just the ideas that have been conditioned into our communities as a result of living in a, a hierarchy of human values. The festival attracts, attracted uh, this wide, diverse uh, uh, collectivity of Blackness, uh, people from all different walks and paths that were centered around health and wellness and social justice, uh, you know, activists, musicians, artists, et cetera, all of these different representations of social change in our communities were able to kind of convene at the festival annually. One type of, uh, uh, of uh, work showed up really uh, poignantly early on in the, in, in the launch of the festival. And uh, that work were, was the work of black farmers. They would come to the festival to sell, you know, produce or value added products and things like that. And uh, I, as a result, developed some really intimate relationships with uh, some of those farmers. They became kind of mentors to me. Um, I like to call them OGs. They're, you know, these were my elders, people that were uh, taking time to, you know, call me, talk on the phone, and just kind of giving me insight and advice around being an activist and community and things like that. Now, one farmer in particular, uh, by the name of Renard Turner uh, from Vanguard Ranch, who's also a board member for the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons, uh, will call me all the time really talking about the importance of us addressing issues of food insecurity in our communities, uh, particularly from a perspective of, you know, what happens if there's disaster. Uh, you know, uh, one of the questions he would ask me is, what would, what does, what would, a, what would a community do if the grocery stores close? And so that question, while it might sound a little alarmist, um, we had heavy storm events in Virginia in the early 2000s, um, well, the mid 2000s, 2007, 2008, 2009, that did close the grocery stores. And that made the work of uh, regenerative agriculture, urban agriculture, just really much more a high priority for me as a uh, as a community activist because you know 
my home where I lived at for over a week, we we couldn't go to the grocery store during Hurricane Gaston, Hurricane Isabel that came through in, in the mid 2000s. So uh, what we decided to do first was, um, you know, connect with those farmers and uh, and build collaborations. And that is the work that uh, uh, was referenced by Brittany in relationship to the to the pop up farmers markets. But in that space, um, sitting with those farmers every Saturday for, you know, the entire summer from 2008 to probably 2012, I was getting all this uh, 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 oral history, all this, uh, 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 community wisdom, you know, just really getting a de facto, uh, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, training with these farmers about why it was important to grow food. Right. Um, and so in tandem with that, I started feeling guilty that here I was in my mid twenties and I got these farmers coming in from 45 minutes, an hour out to bring 200, 300 pounds of produce for us to sell in community. And he, I, I'm a strapping young man at the time, you know, my back was, you know, or I'm 40 now, but my back was was much better when I was in my 20s. Um, and so these, so I, I was thinking to myself, like, what happens if, if something happens to one of these farmers? Then the program we've developed is, you know, it will it will go away. We wouldn't be able to continue. So I started thinking, like, yo, I really need to get into the growing aspect of this. And so the most the 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 first uh, obstacle we ran into is where do we get land? Right. In order to do that, I don't come from a family that has like heirs property or somebody in the county or rural area that I could go and call, say, hey, look, can I go farm on your land? That just wasn't a reality for me. Right. So we, you know, went through what most urban farmers go through and trying to get agreements with municipal government or faith based organizations or even private owners uh, in order to develop farms on those spaces. But the land tenure on those spaces was highly compromised and resulted in us having to, you know, we developed the farm on multiple spaces. And then maybe the folks that own this property decided to go in another direction. And so all of the work that went into the development of that space, and I'm not just talking like the building of raised beds or implanting of uh, or, or, or the planting of trees and, you know, putting down drip irrigation or building high tunnels. I'm talking about the soil work, right? The building up the fertility inside of these urban soils would be compromised instantaneously. And all that work would go down, down the drain, not only the sweat equity, but also the financial investment that we had made in those spaces. And it happened multiple times. It's heartbreaking to see that uh, when people have a really sincere desire to address food insecurity or lack of access to healthy food in their community, but the work of actually building agency and self-determination in communities to solve those problems gets compromised by having to start over over and over again. So um what uh, what what we realized is that we needed to idea we needed to ideally get control over land that would allow us to grow in perpetuity longitudinally and and not be worried about having to be displaced by development or whatever other uh aspirations of the owner of the, of the property um my uh work in this urban ag space uh was so deeply impacted by traveling to different conferences and 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 uh uh workshops and etc and i started going to one in particular in our area called the virginia association for biological farming because that is a core principle for us as growers that you know we wanted to make sure that the food that we were growing was safe not only for human consumption but also safe for the planet safe for the uh and safe for wildlife so we weren't doing pesticides herbicides and uh uh fortunately we were able to make some unique relationships in that space um, I went to several of those sessions and and saw uh, the uh, agrarian trust tabling and 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 you know made note of some of the work of the work that they were doing with, in terms of uh, this commons model. And it was something that I put a bookmark in my head on. Um, I at the same time while doing urban agriculture, I'm also involved in a wide variety of other social 
justice efforts in my community. And one of those had been working with a community land trust. The community land trust that I work with, the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust, uh, at, at, does uh, uh, land uh, acquisition explicitly for the development of affordable housing. So I served as a, I've been serving as a board member uh, with that organization for several years. And so I had a really clear understanding of what it looked like for an organization to take acquisition of land in the city or wherever in order to develop uh, community assets. I sat in on a workshop with uh, Ian and Eliza from the Agrarian Trust in 2020, right before COVID actually, uh, where they kind of broke down their uh, this new agrarian commons model and the idea of removing land from the speculative market and redistributing it into black and brown communities. And I was immediately like, okay, this makes sense. This is this is possibly a way forward for the folks that you know we work with in the in in the, in the in the farming endeavors that we've been investing in in order for us to secure uh long-term land tenure on land um and um at the same time um uh, Callie Walker was in the room and uh you know we I heard her say yeah she wanted to make sure that she got her land into black hands and um you know when she made that comment I was like well I wonder how we can do that and just kind of, again, put that inside of a bookmark in the back of my head. Um, later, uh, after the workshop at the conference, I will reach out to the folks at the Agrarian Trust and try to, uh, and, and make a plea. Like, hey, like, if y'all are serious about this work of connecting Black and Brown communities back to land um, and that you want to also support in terms of financial uh, uh, fundraising for for uh, the development of that land and etc. Let's let's really have a conversation. Um, I think we can make some things happen. And in our case in Richmond, you know, I had already been seeing land being distributed to nonprofit organizations. Um, so yeah, that's how it kind of started. And now, um, you know, we're knee deep in uh, the iteration. Uh, the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons. I think in, it was in December of 2020 when we actually uh, pulled together all of the paperwork to get the uh, organization started um, with the uh, intent of uh, doing two things, acquiring the property from Cali Walker and identifying land in the urban uh, community in order to uh, uh, facilitate access for folks that are doing urban farming. Now, I'm going to just say this, it's, it's really important uh, to do both of those things at the same time, because we recognize that Black communities in our region were predominantly urban, that the folks that we had been working with, uh, the highest concentrations of Black and Brown communities were in the city. And so it was very important for us to not choose an either or, but to identify a both and where the communities that were being disproportionately impacted by these social inequities in the city would be able to access land and be able to uh, uh, hopefully, and, and this is the aspiration, by virtue of them connecting to that land in the urban center, be able to evolve their practice refine uh, their, uh, their, their farming models and be able to move on to a larger piece of property in Amelia, Con uh, in Amelia County. So that's the real uh, purpose for the uh, interdependence of the rural and urban uh, conversation. And, you know, quite obviously we can't grow, you know, enough food in the city in order to really feed people on a scale that also marries uh, uh, the agricultural vocation to a living wage or a living income for the farmer, uh, it would have that would have to happen in tandem with larger acreage that is way more available in the um, in 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 the rural county. And so uh, this act of reparative justice, you know, uh, Cali being intentional about uh, ensuring that that land goes to black and brown communities, and then also the work of the Agrarian Trust to support our, uh, our, our uh, majority Black board in uh, funding the acquisition of property has been tremendously appreciative. I appreciate it. I mean, I think that 
this is a model in terms of the way forward. I mean, in the last two years, we heard so many people talking about racial equity, right? And in uh, the height of the, the rise of COVID and the George Floyd uh, insurrections across the country. Uh, but there was a really deafening silence when it came time to talk about what equity really means. Like, instead of it just being the transition of policies, but how do we ensure, ensure that the material conditions for communities of color were transformed? We, we, nobody really, everybody kind of got cognitive dissonance or went to sleep, but this work showed up in that moment to show that yes, we can redistribute land back into hands of the most marginalized communities and address the fact that you know 98% of farmland in America is in the hands of people of European ancestry. And that is, uh, 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 while it sounds unbelievable, it's something that, it, but it's something that is not intractable. Like we can solve for that through uh, the collaboration with predominantly white led organizations who have the intentionality to use their privilege and power in order to move capital and resources into black and brown communities in a very intentional way. And so, so far, so good, man. We're, uh, I'm excited about it. I think um, uh, we're, we're, we, we acquired, uh, we, we fundraised and acquired uh, some land uh, in Petersburg, Virginia, which is 30 minutes outside of Richmond. At the same time, the transfer of the, the, the uh, uh, Amelia County property uh, took place this past summer. So now we're collectively holding about 80 acres of land explicitly for BIPOC food system stakeholders. And um, the work is, 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 has commenced. You know, we're developing the farm in Petersburg and we're doing design work for the property in Amelia. And I think I'm going to let it, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pause right there. I think that was almost 15 minutes exactly. It, yeah, I am, I am extremely impressed by your punctuality. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to throw it out the window and ask you a follow-up question and make you go sure. over time. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Saran. Um, I just wanted to um, ask, and I'm going to put a picture up here. I think this is of Sankofa Orchard. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd love, well, one, I know you talk a lot about Black land loss and what the, that has to do with this picture. Sure. Um, and I think that's part of a bigger question that I have for you, which is, um, well, just one, like what, what happens when, what, what happens on, you know, at Sankofa um, or when, when black people are empowered and supported to have this relationship with land, what does that look like? Yeah. So my organization, um, Happily Natural Day, um, which I'm the founder and director of, we steward almost seven uh, different community uh, growth spaces across um, our region. And Sankofa is one of our newest, um, it's actually two acres. Um, this space is uh, our training ground. We call it a food justice and climate resiliency demonstration. Uh, it's in the middle of the city, but it's in a part of the city that has been uh, lacking of investment uh, from our municipal government due to some racist policy decisions that were made back in the uh, 70s and, and from in between the 50s and the 70s. Um, what happens at the space? This is uh, uh, what happens when Black people or communities of color have control over land and the resources to develop it. You get a, a, a space that speaks to the cultural realities of those communities. Uh, Sankofa uh, not only is a space where we've planted 80 fruit trees and hundreds of fruiting shrubs and have rows where we're growing annual vegetables, it's also a space where we are uh, showcasing renewable energy, uh, the power of uh, rainwater catchment, stormwater management for our community. And then most importantly, it's a space where when Black and Brown communities show up there, they see representations of uh, cultural uh, identities, people, personalities who have invested in uh, social change in their community, but explicitly, like we put a through line, these are all people that were activists that articulated the importance of land 
and what land means to communities of color. So we had people like Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, people like George Washington Carver, uh, people like Emil Carr Cabral, you know, and it's not just like American identities. These are global diasporic and uh, identities, people who have articulated the need for control of the place that communities of color reside and find themselves. And so that inspires visitors to think through how we can go back to the past and identify solutions that have already been implemented or articulated and apply those lessons to our to our presence. So it connects us to a continuum of historical change that has been, you know, unimpeded since, you know, the beginning of colonialization and slavery, like that this, this is a work that is an arc, right? When you hear about the arc of justice that Martin Luther King talks about, like we try to in, invite people into that arc through land-based uh, 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 stewardship and, uh, and, and social change in that regard. Um, it's a place of mindfulness because it's very rare that you have a space that is designed in a way that speaks specifically to communities of colors, cultural reality and historical context. And when folks come into that space, the first thing that they usually say is like, wow, I feel at home. I feel at peace. And it's like, that is a, there's, there's a, you know, of course there's historical, there's a research that shows like the cortisol levels that drop when you enter into a, a nature-based place or you get outside and things like that. So just multiply that by seeing your own reflection in the historical context and all of these powerful narratives surrounding the space as you you know pick some apples or if you pick some kale or whatever it is that we got growing there you know and kids being able to run free in a space and see uh, a, a, a a mural of a, of a Asada Shakur right um that's uh, in our uh community work this is like placemaking time plus right? Uh, creation of uh, trauma-informed spaces, spaces that are helping to facilitate healing just by virtue of their passive existence. And so, yeah, that's what happens. I mean, it's, for <laughs> us, it's really, uh, it's really about how do we transform our communities? Yeah. Literally, like, what do we do to, to metamorph the built environment um, where we live? And then also, like, let this be a, uh, a gateway to you tapping into a larger context of agriculture as uh, a tool for social change, right? Like agroecology is a literal piece of this work. And that means like, it's not just about growing food, it's also about the growing of people and the relationships to, you know, the earth and the, 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 the context that we find ourselves in this hierarchy of human value. And how do we upset that? Right. And, and and that the land didn't do the uh, traumatic things to us. Like, how do we reconnect to that land and, and start to iterate solutions for our communities that are longstanding? Wow. Yes. Um, thank you so much for kind of giving us that picture. And um, yeah, it's just it's it is such beautiful, important healing work on so many levels and so many, so many layers of ecologies. So thank you so much, Jerron. I think as you, you summoned Fannie Lou Hamer as your outro, I just, I feel called to, I looked up this quote that I just love from Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm. Um, down where we are, food is used as a political weapon, but if you have a pig in your backyard, some vegetables in your garden, you can feed yourself and your family. Yeah, we have a mural of Fannie Lou Hamer at the space. Uh, you know, <laughs> sick and tired of being sick and tired. This is the re this is real for us. Like, how, this is these are not just like Black History Month bullet points. Yeah. This is like a part of the ethos of why we do what we do. We're trying to transform social realities for our communities, and um, we could talk about policies, but the people need to see, feel, taste, smell change. Right. So it's like. We do the policy work too, but I want to introduce you to what happens when we create this new world. A, a friend of mine shared me a quote uh, that said that we are hospicing the old world and midwifing in the new one, right? And so this type of work that we're doing, iterating land justice solutions with reparative justice at the center, 
is really us creating the new world that we believe can be. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for all you are doing to midwife that new world. We celebrate you and we're so grateful for your time. Um, and we'll bring you back on for a conversation, but for now we will bring on someone who is resourcing that new world and supporting that midwifery through literally providing some of the groundwork for it to happen. So we'll bring on Callie here. Thank you so much for Duran. Please show Duran some love in the chat. Um, while we bring on Callie, Callie Walker is a Methodist minister. She lives in Amelia, Virginia. Um, um, her what was her father's hundred acre farm um, and Callie and her husband Dan have been big on the work of hunger relief um, and simple living for a long time and have been living out a life a lifelong commitment to that simple living and with that I think many of you will find a great kinship with who Callie is and her story um, and um, yeah Kelly and Dan have been influenced by the work of Hyper International, um, influenced by their learnings that the global average farm size is less than an acre, that small holdings get far better management than huge commercial farms, and that land produces more than enough, or sorry, more food through hand tools and mechanization. So they've been seeking a way to bring community onto their, onto Kelly's family farm um, for many years and found CVAC as part of that. And the walkers um, hope to see a neighborhood of food growers develop on the land that they're donating. Callie says it's a dream she would not have been able to live into on their own. And with that, I will invite you, Callie, just to share your story of how this all came about. Great. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, thank you, Duran, too. I always learn, uh, uh, anytime I ever get to hear you speak, I learn new things. Uh, I thought I would start my story for this group in the year 2000. Uh, back then, I was about 32. I was finishing seminary. Um, at, the, at that point in time, I sort of saw the two biggest, most important things on earth as being anti-racism work and sustainable living work. And these were the things I wanted to throw my life and my pastoral ministry into doing and being. There was a question for me that was kind of the big question and has remained the big question for me, which is how well can I live without taking more than my share of the earth's resources? Right. I don't really want to, um, you know, I don't want to take a vow of poverty, say, to the extent of uh, Francis and Claire of Assisi, um, but I don't want to take more than my share either. I don't I don't want to live well at someone else's expense on Earth um, or the whole planet. And so this was a big driving question for me. Also, in the year 2000. Uh, I was beginning to feel drawn back to my hometown, Amelia, Virginia. At that time, I lived in Philadelphia. I had for 11 years, uh, but I was beginning to feel drawn back towards home. Uh, so I was working as a United Methodist pastor and asking our hierarchy to get me back to Virginia, to get me uh, close to Richmond or Amelia in 2001. I began dating the man I would eventually marry and eventually bring home to the family farm. In 2006, we got married and we attended an event at Duke called a Pastor's Convocation on Sustainable Living. At that event, Wes Jackson from the Land Institute, he gave one answer to that question that, that drove me. You know, I used to think, how, 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 how well can I live and not be taking more than one six billionth of the earth's resources? And of course that has had to increase to seven billionth. And, and now I just think towards 2050 and one nine billionth. But Wes Jackson had an answer for that question. Uh, he said to all of us at that convocation on sustainable living, if, 
the Earth's people who are living lives above the level of the old order Amish, which is to say lives with electricity and cars, uh, lives that are more than about a five mile radius of home. <laughs> if those of us who are living above the level of the old order Amish would bring that down to the level of the old order Amish, everybody on earth up to 9 billion people and sustainably forever can come up to the level of the old order Amish, enough food, no malnourishment, uh, social networks, um, local and regional food systems. So that became a driving concept for me and um, you know, gave more teeth to the phrase live simply that others may simply live. Um, during those years of leaving Philadelphia, moving to Virginia, and in particular to rural Virginia and getting married and moving to the mountains of Virginia before we got back home to Amelia, uh, I would have what many people might call a mission drift, a drifting uh, from that dual focus of anti-racism work and sustainable living to sustainable living, just sustainable living. Didn't have my network and my group that had a lot of uh, organization that was in Philadelphia for anti-racism work. And it was much harder to find such groups in rural Virginia or to get people interested in forming such groups. And uh, it wasn't that that wasn't there and it wasn't that that didn't uh, appear in sermons, but it just wasn't organized work for me anymore. The sustainable living was, I could figure out how to do that in terms of local food growing and local networking. And so my dad in those years was asking, what are you gonna do with this land when I'm gone? You know, I'm gonna leave you, you know, 134 acres if I don't need a nursing home, if you don't have to sell it to send me to the nursing home, but what are you gonna do with this land? And, and so I had, I had for years been thinking about this question and it was always influenced um, by some sense of intentional community. In the 90s, when I was doing full-time youth work and living with a bunch of single people doing full-time youth work, I imagined uh, a sort of a youthful religious community of do-gooders that wanted to be out in rural Virginia with me. Uh, and then into the 2000s, as I had shifted and become much more focused on anti-racism and sustainability work, and even more so on sustainability work, uh, then I imagined it's the environmentalist nutcases. That's the community we're gonna collect. The people who want to live more simply, who want to do with less, who want to grow food for others, the, just the environmentalist do-gooders. Um, and then as that just over and over didn't really materialize, people we talked to or people we, who tried out their dream on our property, uh, Several of them had the very important and wonderful learning that, no, this is not the life I want. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I did not go into debt buying land for this life. Uh, and they moved on. They apps, they went back to the old job or the old career or the old place or a new place. Um, one couple stayed and has become a part of our extended family. Uh, but mostly what we hoped for was not materializing and then at that same Virginia Association of Biological Farmers. Uh, by 2020, I had been attending that for probably about 15 years and I imagined Duran for longer than that. Um, and I had encountered him there years before and I had encountered Agrarian Trust there years before, but I had forgotten that. Uh, but it wasn't some notes I discovered later. Anyway, they gave that presentation that Duran just mentioned and it just clicked for me, okay. There's one more missing piece that's not in my vision statement. I don't want to just narrow it from religious do-gooders to environmentalist do-gooders. I want to narrow it fuller, fuller still to people of color and probably just straight up black, African-American people who have an environmentalist do-gooder spirit. Let's just narrow it that much and see where we can go. So. I began the conversation with uh, Eliza 
and Ian, who were at that conference, and Eliza is from Virginia, so she kind of became a main point of contact. Um, and she put me together in touch on the telephone with a couple of other people uh, doing some sort of black farming advocacy, black women. And we had conversations on the phone. And, uh, and, and I think she may have mentioned that she was in conversation with Duran. She also uh, recruited the man that Duran mentioned earlier, Renard. What's Renard's last name? Turner. Thank you. <laughs> I blank on all kinds of things sometimes. Um, she recruited Re Renard Turner as a kind of a consultant for us. I had also met him through this same group and their annual conference. Um, so we were having conversations, sometimes monthly conversations, sometimes individual conversations. And in less than a year from that January 2020 conference, we were forming a board of directors to have a legal entity to organize this whole thing. Um, what had literally happened for me is that I had inherited 134 acres of farmland. My brother also inherited 134 acres right side by side. Um, and he is actively raising beef cattle on this land uh, to a large extent on both pieces of land. Um, and I am not, right? I, my husband and I both work off the farm as non-Methodist pastors. And we really want to collect people who are farmers or maybe relinquish the land to people who are farmers. And at this point, we've clarified that so, so much, right? Chemical free, natural food, soil building, regenerative processes, people of color, African-Americans, probably from Virginia with Virginia's uh, incredibly awful history, just incredibly awful history. Um, so, so that's kind of where we've gotten to at this point. Uh, since we began to incorporate in 2020, December of 2020, then December of, then the year 2021, that became the year of zoning research. Uh, Renard's advice was you, Callie, who know your county and your county officials and have a history there, you figure out your county zoning, you figure out what number of parcels we should get the land into, what the options are, and have all of that accomplished before making the land donation. So it's you getting that work done and having those conversations instead of an outside organization. And so I did that and he and I just went, did. We, we did, we made great planning. We just made great planning. Uh, we, we made the presentation that our zoning official really recommended for our project and she was super encouraging. Uh, but not all of our neighbors were super encouraging. Some of our neighbors felt like our plans were something that would uh, make them feel afraid to take a walk on the road or make them feel like someone was likely to break into their home. People who had known me for a long time said stuff like that. People who somehow didn't seem to grasp that this is gonna be a community that I'm gonna live in the middle of for a lot longer than you are because I'm gonna outlive you by 20 or 30 years. Uh, anyway, there was enough opposition there and given the dynamics of the people who would ultimately vote on that zoning decision, we just pulled that request entirely and started working with our zoning official. What can we do with the zoning we already have? What makes the most sense there? So then 2022 has been the year of getting the land into the number of parcels that we can use with the zoning we have, um, which is four parcels. It's two larger parcels of 42 acres and 33 acres and then two smaller parcels of six acres each. And so that's all done. It's all completed. It's all donated. Um, geez, that was the hardest part, I think. Now everything feels like it has potential and possibility. Um, my own sense of stewardship and responsibility was such that it always felt wrong to me that one person would own so much land. And it always felt dangerous for the soil itself right because as one person I'm taking shortcuts all the time for how to get everything done uh, but when people 
have smaller amounts of soil to grow their things on, they take better care of it. I know that from my own garden and life. Um, so my whole religious life has been especially shaped by those teachings of Jesus that are related to, say, Lazarus and the rich man, or the guy that wants to build the bigger barns, um, or the rich young ruler. Those are the ones who have always, those are the ones that have spoken deeply to me, going out into the highways and the byways and bringing in the lame. Um, then what I've learned over life, maybe building on that foundation or alongside of it, I, I really believe there's something about rugged individualism, American individualism, that is much worse or much more individualizing among white folks. So when I have lived among black folks or among immigrants, I speak Spanish and so I have some good experiences, glorious, wonderful experiences too, among immigrants. Uh, but I have been aware that there is a much greater sense of responsibility for each other than I normally feel like I experience among white folks. And it's, in my experience, it hasn't been exclusive to each other in communities of color. It has reached out to include me. And I have felt more buffered, cared about, included, more like somebody would come to my rescue in communities of color than I have in communities of white folks. So, so I actually really literally feel like a world that will be a neighborhood that will be great for me is going to emerge better than it could have any other way. And yet the nature of the world I have grown up is such that I would have just accidentally defaulted to white people. The people I would have found and collected would have been people who looked like me. Uh, if, but for this piece, with the Agrarian Trust at the Virginia Association of Biological Farmers, but for the work of Duran and Bernard and others who are with us. And I promise you, Duran is not the only person doing this in the world. He's not the only person doing this in Richmond. There are people doing this in every city and there are just many of them, glorious, wonderful people. There are people doing this work where you are. And if you find them, I think it will be as wonderful for you as it is for me. God bless you. Thank you, Callie. Um, man, you, but both of you, exactly 15 minutes. I can't believe it. And I'm going to break the rules again and ask you a follow up question, um, which, and I'm going to use some slides. We've used this because we talk, we, we talk about you. We use this in our first, as an example, in our first Land Justice Futures course. Um, this is not to scale, but this is, I think, a real photo of your family farm. Yes. Um, and you did something really unique. You didn't donate the full, because you're talking about this now, about having a neighborhood um, or you know, being a neighbor. And that's because in your case, as I understand it, you donated most, most of the property outright. Fee simple donation, if you want to use fancy language, but you just said, here you go. CVAC, let's do this. And then there's this smaller parcel that you you did a life estate on. So this is, you did all the paperwork so that now, so that when you and Dan pass on, that last bit will go to CVAC, but it allows you then to live out your days in, in place and on the farm still. Um, and I just think that that's, a really um, relevant model for a lot of folks that are thinking about um, the future on this call. And so, and you've said, you know, I'm I'm trading my assets for the best neighbors in the world. And then that that piece that you just said now of like, and I almost, and I almost did this in a way on accident that was entirely white because of the way that the world kind of keeps us out of relationships. So I guess if there's anything you want to add about that specific arrangement and what arrange yes. what what that was like. Yes, I would like to sort of clarify just a little bit. Um, we have kept the portion of land that has the house on it. 
We have donated land that doesn't have any housing or infrastructure on it. Um, the portion that we kept, it has a, a, a secondary vision of developing a retirement center for aging, probably single again, do-gooders who want to live very minimalistically, who would like moving into a situation where they really have one room and some shared facilities, people for whom that would meet their sense of what is good, um, a good housing footprint environmentally and that kind of thing. So uh, by the advice of Bernard Turner, we retained ownership of that to work on that vision. And then as we work further on that vision, figure out whether we want to donate that land to the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons. Almost certainly, we want to donate it to some nonprofit that gives us lifetime right to live here. And I say that because while we are United Methodist pastors, um, Dan is a United Methodist pastor in retirement, and I am a United Methodist pastor on leave of absence. Uh, so those distinctions, even a part-time distinction, means that we do not qualify for United Methodist health insurance policies for their pastors. So Dan is old enough to have Medicare coverage for health insurance, and I am young enough to not qualify for that for a long time still. So I don't have health insurance, right? And when land gets lost in this country, the biggest cause of that is health bills, medical bills. Um, and it just seems, it just seems to me that land is much more secure. Uh, this land is much more secure for us to live on, live out our days on if we get it into nonprofit ownership than if we try to retain private ownership. Thanks, Callie. Um, thank you, Callie and Durant. We're gonna bring you um, and, and thanks for that, digging into some of that nitty gritty. I think this is where, this is the place of study where it's the, the values and the big ideas and the nitty gritty of how does this actually come together is so important for us to be studying together. We're gonna invite questions in just a minute. Um, I'm going to play a video um, that tells the story of CVAC and you'll see both Duran and Callie um, as a part of that. And while that's playing, um, and Brenna, if you want to flag yourself in the chat again, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask in the Q&A, please um, send those Brenna's way. So we'll just take a little palate cleanser here, watch this five minute little short film, and um, please send your questions to Brenna and we'll open it up for Q&A. One minute here while I get this ready. Okay, dismiss. And let's go theater mode here. Everybody see this? All right. When you grow up in the city, you don't really have a reference point to see firsthand and experience firsthand how food makes it to your table. It has not been. Brittany, we just lost it. I don't know if. Yep, sorry. Hang on a second. Military family, really on and around military bases. So I did not come from landed family. My family had no land. It's assumed that if you're black, you came from an urban area in the modern world, because there was a time if you were black, it was assumed you came from a rural area, but that changed post Civil War. Particularly black and brown people are faced with high concentration poverty, you know, public health issues, all types of challenges and social inequities. And the work we do around developing green spaces, I consider this a liberation work. We're losing 30,000 acres of land every year, we meaning African-American community, and we now own less land collectively than we did in the year 1935. Like, how do we level the playing field for folks that grew up in poverty?
My father bought this land in 1968. All of my life he grew a garden and my mom put us to work in it and had us picking and shelling and all that sort of thing. Cattle farming, that was my dad's thing. When we heard the Agrarian Trust presentation and they emphasized the injustices toward black ownership of land, Dan and I thought, oh, we don't have children. There's nobody we have to leave the land to. And lo and behold, maybe like five, maybe six months later, Callie Walker decided to donate 80 acres to the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons and said, hey, I want to make sure that this land goes into black or brown farmer hands. The development of this piece of land to serve as an incubator for people of color who wish to come out and learn about agriculture, that's the real takeaway gift here. And we hope to develop it into a self-sustaining, vibrant community. We want to work on a whole farm to consumer network with two to five or seven farming businesses that are doing complementary things. With the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons, we aspire to connect people to both rural land as well as urban land. By acquiring land in the urban space, we can use that land for folks to be trained and learn to get their chops and then move on to larger parcels of property. You know, it's, it's not just something that we just do. It's we understand why we're doing it and the significance to people who look like me is break the chains. And one of the last vestiges of that is being chained to food systems that you're not included in. That's why agriculture is the game changer. I don't have a firm answer to the question of how does a person or a household figure out when they're taking too much of the Earth's resources and somebody else is bound to suffer. But the sense that to whom much is given, much is required, that has taken a deep root in me. Uh, and I really want to live into dispersing the resources that I've been given and trading them off, I hope, for a form of extended family. I feel like this is the way that we charge up new generations to appreciate farmers, to become farmers. I see it happening in real time, just how community members are empowered by having access to land. We're not worried about a developer coming in with an offer and being like, yo, you gotta go. Like, no, we can take root. That's what I'm hoping we'll be able to build here and show by example that a community can really be built up and operated by people of color that are successful in agricultural ventures and live sustainably so that five generations from now when I'm gone, that this place can still be standing and people can still be learning here. So we're gonna work to see, can we make that happen? You could think that donating land means you're just giving away everything that you have, but what I really feel like I'm doing is I'm trading it for near neighbors who are growing food who care about the masses of humanity, who are taking on the social causes. Uh, I'm trading it for the world's best neighbors. We're on the cusp of showing the world what can be done when organizations understand their positionality. The Agrarian Trust shows up as a collaborator to help create these liberation strategies for communities that have been marginalized. And that's the type of work that we need to be doing right now. I'm hype about it. All right, give it up for Central Virginia Agrarian Commons, everybody. <laughs> um, all right, we're gonna open the, the, the floodgates here and just have a conversation for the rest of our time. Um, and I think I'll just start by asking you, Duran and Callie, like, um, what's it been like to work together? How, yeah, just, yeah, Duran, I see you. Go uh, for it. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been, it's been great. I mean, personally, um, 
I uh, feel like there was some there there was a there was a moment where we had to really like get clear on what we were doing, you know what I mean, and like why we were doing what we were doing. Um, there was some struggles in terms of like how do we prioritize like urban versus rural, just to be fully transparent. That you know uh, we had to wrestle in that space and we had to sit in that uncomfortableness um a little bit because um there's ideological or philosophical theor theory that you know cities are failed concepts and that we need to get away from cities altogether right um but uh we ended up landing on the both end you know and that um you know it it, it honored the importance of rural ag and urban ag that exists amongst the um the board members and um, i think we are better for it you know we've already brought in uh our first new board member tyrone cherry who's a farmer on the petersburg property right um and his work is just magnificent right he's engaging communities young people and so he's bringing a new view onto what we're doing that we wouldn't have had it otherwise you know um internally you know it is kind of there are, there are some kind of like questions right we're still in this iterative stage um uh, where we're still trying to figure out some things you know first of all the homestead piece is really kind of it's a it's a it's a bit of a conundrum uh because we don't want people to be anchored to debt and mortgages um in terms of like living on the land in Amelia but we do also recognize that people don't have access to capital and are not exactly always credit ready or loan ready uh, from the traditional banking system so like what do we do in it in, in in that what's that third thing right is it us financing the uh building of homes for people um uh, that's still something that we're trying to iterate on and i mean this is like again a part of the new world that you know we're trying to articulate um the the but i feel good because i feel like we the 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 core founding members have all been like super passionate about this and um yeah and then you know Callie and I uh to be frank have been kind of like the the leaders of the charge I feel like in many in many ways um like we're talking about this we're active about this we're like trying to make the connections and things like that yeah. um we're kind of front front facing um, of course, because Callie's living on the land and she's made a donation. And then because I, I'm actively training folks in community. So I have like, you know, I got 12 people in a class right now that, <laughs> you know what I mean? That I'm like, hopefully you guys get on this incubator farm. And then three years from now, you're going over there with Callie. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's been great. It, it's, 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 uh, it's been a short amount of time mm -hmm. and we've done a lot in a little bit of time, which is really uh, amazing. And it speaks to the passion of the folks in the room. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to our next stages, you know, the kind of the design work that we're doing on Amelia right now um, is, 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 is exciting. And Callie's been very graciously hosting like meetings and getting people over to her property numerous times from the board. And so um, that the relationship building is 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 key. You know, it helps that I knew Callie or knew of Callie before we started doing this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so there's a there was a, a a respect, you know, for each other's work mutually. And then the other people that are in the room, Renard and Michael Carter and uh, Nikki Diamo and Eliza. So everybody kind of have were familiar with each other. This is not like people just forcing square pegs together. It, you know, it, it, it's been like a community of folks that already have familiarity with each other's work. That made it a lot easier than if we were all strangers in the room and yeah. didn't know anything about each other's work.
Yeah. I'll, I'd and, like to answer the question starting a little bit earlier from the time when we were pretty much all strangers. Um, I feel like I knew Duran before he knew me because when I encountered him as a leader or a panelist at the VABF conference year after year in different capacities, um, I was one of hundreds of people attending the conference, right? So he didn't know me or remember me. There was no impression. He had no impression of me. So in this year, 2020, at the same conference, when we heard that presentation, it would have been in January. And I thought, well, I want to talk to him about that. Mm -hmm. And I think we even sat close to each other in the room, but that time went away and, and the everybody was out of the room and we were in the hallways. And, and so I tried to talk to him in a hallway, but he had another appointment with somebody else and he had no time for me. And so he just said, yeah, I'm late for somebody else, maybe another time and kept on walking. <laughs> right? so, so I'm the white lady who wants to donate land to a black project, which is kind of weird to begin with too, right? And you sort of feel like, well, that's gonna feel like a power play or a manipulative thing. It's kind of awkward, at least to me, it felt kind of awkward to initiate a conversation about. Um, so another of our board members, Michael Carter Jr. was a, also a presenter at the conference that particular year. I don't think I had encountered him before that year, but I can't remember for sure. Um, and, and he just has a prominent way about him, right? So I, said, so I just say to myself, well, I'm going to approach him and talk to him and ask him about it. And I did. Um, and, and he was just kind of very gracious. And pretty much what he said to me is, you know, I told Eliza when I first heard about this whole idea that there are no white people in Virginia that want to donate land to black people. And uh, yeah, that's what he said to me. So, so I don't remember either whether Renard Turner was there that year, but he was there many years and he was the um, president of the entire organization for several years as well. So, so, um, so I had some knowledge of them, but imagine how much they didn't know about me or my background or what my agenda was or what angle I was coming from um, or whether I knew any comprehensive U.S. or Virginia history or whether I only knew the stuff that they teach you here in fourth grade and in eighth grade and in 12th grade. Um, kind of a civil war focused angle on history in Virginia. Um, you know, so, so, so all the stuff that makes it awkward to come together to begin with across racial lines for anything substantive, it was, you know, it was just a, a, a step along the way. It was a very manageable step mm -hmm. along the way. Those hurdles were certainly my own emotionally. Can I really reach a cross yeah. the color barrier to talk about this thing um and and i don't know what suspicions they had or may still have right because I, I my blind spots are still blind to me whatever they may be i can't see them yet so so we'll see what little hurdles we have to come up with or big ones along the way but but mostly we are um we're appreciating each other and we're sharing a vision and a direction and I think we're just going to deal with our hurdles along the way, however they come up. Thank you both. Um, follow up question. Um, just um, well, there's so much than the donation itself that that has that is included in a real solidarity rooted relationship that is alive here. Um, so there's a few other questions around that. I think the first I'll ask a lot of communities, um, a, a question we hear a lot is like, we're in our majority white area, a rural area that's majority white. So the first question of like, is there anyone around that would actually be interested? Callie, I hear you saying like, these people are everywhere. Like there are projects like this in every city, in every area, um, but right, the, the barrier kind of keeps us apart. Mm -hmm. But there's a second question of, Will people want to be here, right? I'm hearing you talk about unwelcoming neighbors and um, this, this questions of safety for communities of color that come up. Um, so there's a question from Libby that was in the chat, um, uh, who's a co-member of the community of Loretto that whose um, land is based in Kentucky. 
Uh, do I understand correctly that Black people are not exactly welcome in the region or the county? If so, I'd like more information on how you are all navigating that. Does it deter Black people from wanting to get involved and get out there? Um, yeah, so Duran, I go, yeah, I see you. But I, how, so Duran, it's a yes. it's a, it's, how about it's a, if I start? Do you mind if I okay. start? I would yeah. be sort of a, perhaps my answer will be more historical and yours will be more current. That's what yeah. I'm. Um, my so my county is currently about seventy four percent white and about twenty percent black and some other percentage of other, right? When I was a teenager, my county was about fifty percent black and fifty percent white. So that's the nineteen eighties. If you were to go back to the uh, seventeen ninety census. There were 11,500 people enslaved in my county, 11,500. Uh, my county currently has almost 13,000 total human beings in it, total now. So there was a time when an almost equal number to the current residency was enslaved here. So this is not a land without a history of black folks living on it. Mm -hmm. However, that does not quite get to the immediate question about the present day, does it? Um, certainly there are people who live out all of their days, people of color, black folks who live out all of their days in Amelia County, just as there are white folks that do that. Um, there are no recorded records there is no criminal violence against Black people uh, recorded in my county in my lifetime. So since 1968, however, I personally am aware of some charges, felony charges made against Black people that were just ridiculously absurd. They didn't happen. They were, you know, like, just bizarre stuff, just bizarre. So yes, there is racism that expresses its way in hostile and damaging ways uh, within my county. Not violent lately, but you know, it only takes one individual for violence to happen. Okay. Uh, well, how are, Callie, how are you yeah. all navigating that in now creating a vision that's, yeah, that's, so I was going to chime in real quick just to say, like, um, I'm a native, so I was born and raised in Richmond. So Amelia County is like, you know, it's 45 minutes away um, from me, right? Uh, when I go, when I go to Amelia, uh, the thing that makes it feel unsafe are the signs that say this is Trump country and, you know, he's, this election was stolen and this, that, and the third. And, you know what I mean? Like people are like the Confederate flags and et cetera, that are like along route, the, uh, route 360 to go to the property. Right. Uh, no, it's like, I don't want to be caught out here after dark and my car broke down. Like, it makes me kind of like personally from my own like history with like, just microaggressions and like any actions with the police and that's just the police but what brought this stuff to life in terms of like there might be some energy is that this is a republic this is a conservative republican county right and you know the rise of the alt-right over the last two years the proud boys and all this type of stuff are not realities that i like we're ignoring right we know that these energies exist and there's pockets of people that are you know xenophobic and racist and you know maybe won't even say that they're racist but really hold really uh jacked up stereotypes about black and brown people in their mind right so for for me uh it's it's uh there's this there's this both thing going on there's people that are totally interested in like uh homesteading and reconnecting with this immediate property i mean i did, I did a post on my social media like two days ago and like 50 comments from people all across you know the spectrum like yes how i'm interested how do i get involved da, 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 da. and so in our in my mind it's like okay there's a lot of different interests so how do we facilitate people's involvement 
um, and make sure that that there is a system of support that exists in both, you know, the city of Richmond and Petersburg, you know, that can support like if people were to move onto the land today and wanted to homestead, how are they being built into a community, a pre-existing community of connectivity, of care, right? That they're not just isolated in Amelia. And so what um, we've been trying to work towards in the design of the space is that there, there's a, there's a, a, an engine that exists on the Amelia property by virtue of a bed and breakfast that is run by someone that is ex 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 uh, excited to participate in this in this project, uh, and they can generate uh, uh, income, right, by virtue of being an employee of the bed and breakfast or an employee of the you know the the the, the business itself while living on the land, and that helps us grow people's connectivity to the space, right? Uh, we also are trying to parcel out land to people that might not live on the property but they're farming on it, you know what I mean? And that also helps to build that community of care. So it's not just folks operating in isolation. Um, so yeah, just to answer your question, it's like navigating it is kind of like, uh, we, we just have to develop systems where there's communities that, uh, and when I say communities, I mean that plural, like there's geo geospatial communities where people are able to connect. There's black people in Amelia today you know, that are, you know, some elderly, some younger that have land and trying to identify who where those folks are and, and like, how do we build them into the system of aggregation and farming and like creating supply chains from rural to urban and that as well. So I think it's kind of, um, you know, it's just the nature of the beast, you know, uh, white flight and in the, in the 60s, you know, created these dichotomies where like, you know, black folks is like, yo, I'm getting the heck out of these rural areas. I'm not trying to farm because these systems are terroristic and, you know, marginalizing. So I'm yeah. going to the city. And then, you know, folks and uh, white folks in the city were like, yo, all these black people in the city and now stuff is desegregated. I'm moving out to the suburbs and to the county. That's just, this is America for you, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. that's, that's just me. Yeah. And, and speaks to why, you know, Black land ownership went from 14% of all rural farmland in the mm -hmm. U.S. after the Civil War in the, in the 1920s to right. so 1% now, right? And so I'm hearing in what you're saying, like the answer isn't to give in, right? But to create right. a community of care that allows for this connection to happen. Thank you both uh, so much. I would we're, we're really like short on time. I, I, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask one more question and it, Callie, it'll fold in. So if you want to add anything here. Um, please do. Um, cause my question is very general and it's, you know, this is a, we are a community of people, mostly folks from religious communities that are trying to show, to really figure out like, what does land justice embodied for our property plan look like? And how do we really show up in solidarity? So what does solidarity look like when it's real, um, mm. when it's good? Mm. Um, so that'll be my closing question. Callie, if you want to wrap anything from the last question in with that, please do. Um, no, I'll move on. Um, the first thing that pops into my head is I wrote a kind of a poem once, or maybe it was a newsletter article, um, but it took that first Corinthians 13, love is this and love is that and love is not this and love is not that. And I replaced the word love with the word solidarity. Um, at the time I was in Puerto Rico at a, on the island of Vieques where there's a Navy base that's worthy of some resistance. And so I was amidst a community of resistance and, and uh, a diverse community gathered around that purpose. Um, and so that group inspired the thinking of the word solidarity in that slot in place of love. So that's not, that's probably not quite as specific as you mean within this group, but that was my first thought. I'll pass it to Ron. So um, thank you for sharing that, Callie. Um, for, for us, uh, or for me, I've had relationship with predominantly white institutions in, in this work uh, for some time. You know, some things have stuck, some things have been 
you know, seasonal, right? Um, and so allyship for, for me is about how do we create a relationship where the communities of color that are in relationship to these primarily white institutions retain their autonomy, right? And uh, are able to be resilient if and or uh, uh, those primarily white institutions decide that they, you know, they can't continue to stand as resolutely in solidarity, right? And so an act of solidarity in my, uh, in this particular experience has been the creation of the CVAC as an autonomous organization that is in partnership and collaboration with the Agrarian Trust, but stands alone as, as its own entity. And um, that means for us that if anything ever happens, say, uh, uh, Ian and Agrarian Trust decide that they are no longer going to be doing this type of thing. Uh, the resources that we have been able to uh, tap into by virtue of the relationship will still be retained by this predominantly Black-led organization, right? And that um, the, the, the vulnerability, so the thing about this is that this requires extreme levels of, and we're not even really extreme, but this is like you know, everybody has to show up with a level of vulnerability, right? And that's that's important. It's like, you can't like just skip over the fact that I have to show up and like, I have something to lose in this. You know what I mean? Credibility, uh, you know, time, you know, resources, land, all that type of stuff. There's things that could be lost. So stepping into the space to try to shape the relationship that can be, that the that, that there nobody loses out you know what i mean in 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 building a relationship with one another it's like being married and having a marriage that's like equitable that's not like you know oh you know i'm doing all i work the 9 to 5 you stay home you stop going to school you know you just raise the babies and then if you know somebody steps out on the marriage then the one person don't have nothing, you know, that's not the, that's that we're trying to operate against that idea. Like how do we come together so that if we have to part ways, like this organization itself can live on in perpetuity and it develop the land that has been developed can continue on. And I feel like that's true solidarity is like, how do you put the resources in the room and then be willing to, be, uh, to understand that it you at any moment, it's okay for you to step away because the goal was to resource the communities that have been marginalized. That was the mission mm -hmm. and the mission, That's right. you know what I mean? At any moment we've accomplished. So we, if, if nothing else happens, we accomplished this, this part of the mission. There's yeah. still more work to be done. You dig what I'm saying? But it's not reliant on like, you know, uh, people uh, uh, feeling like they have to stay there just because this is, this is, a, this is because everybody believes in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and and, yeah. and it's like we're trying to leave these leave communities that didn't have these resources with those resources so that they can make the decisions and be self-determining. That's the core value and principle. I feel like if you approach yeah. partnerships with that in mind, like I want you to be self-determining, you know what I mean? That it's not your your relationship remove is moves out of this benevolent charity model. And then it becomes an act of justice where it's like, yo. You don't really need me. I'm just trying to show up and do the right thing in terms of this uh, this disparity in capital and resources. And once that's done, I, you know, you could continue using your power and privilege to keep, you know, helping resource and build up the nature of the work. But, you know, it it's already better, you know what I'm saying, because yeah. of your first step, I guess, if that makes sense. Mm. I love that. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you for um, modeling what this can look like and what's possible to dream about from that stance of solidarity. Um, with that, you know, that vulnerable goal of saying, if all we do is support the self-determination um, of this community, that's enough. Um, and uh, tying it back to the Corinthians verse, solidarity does not seek its own way, right? Um, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, 
I know we're at time. So uh, Brenna, I'll ask you if you can pin um, Ian and Christina. I just want to um, thank them. They've been in the audience and they are a part of the National Agrarian Commons team. And um, we'll just, uh, I'm going to put, sorry, and I'm offering up your, <laughs> you can forward it to whoever you need to, but um, Ian is the is the director of Agrarian Trust, which which supports these 13 and growing agrarian commons around the country. If you have questions specifically about the agrarian commons model and what might be possible where you live, those are great questions for Ian and Christina. Um, and if you have questions to follow up with either of our speakers, you can reach out to us and we can try to make those connections. But, um, you know, I, I, I want to bring the other faces on the screen too, because the truth is there's a growing national network of making land justice possible, real, sustainable forever in, in our country and beyond. And there are many people behind the scenes to make this work and that are part of our ecosystem. So um, yeah, so thank you to all of you and all those unseen that are making that possible. My last announcement before I let us go is that there is an upcoming training. Brenna dropped the link in the chat. If you wanna explore more, what does real solidarity look like in a land transition? What does it look like to come in a good way to the table to explore what's possible? Super vulnerable. Callie at the conference saying, what do I, I got? I want to, I want to, I want to approach these folks. I want to talk about this. They don't know me. I don't know them. There's power dynamics. It's complicated. The Center for Ethical Land Transition is going to walk us through dive really deeply into the elements of a genuine land offer and how to really do that in a place of solidarity. So please check that out. Sign up even if you can't make it. You'll get the recording December 13th. Great way to end up the year um, as we round out this season of waiting and hoping. Um, may we hope and wait for light to come and maybe we'll be active parts, active sources of bringing light back into this world. Um, I'm going to take us all off spotlight so we can wave goodbye mm. so we can see each other. Da, da, da. We move, we move, we move, we move mine. There. Goodbye, everybody. <coughs> I know some folks, okay, folks are already leaving, but thanks for the extra minutes, those who stayed. Take uh, care. Thank you. That was incredible. Feel free to come off mute and say bye. I'm so <laughs> really fascinating so and Bye. inspiring. Thank, Thank you. you. Very, very Thank cool. you. I hope you Bye. enjoyed Have this so week. we can watch it again.